So there's a uh, sort of a local sort of kayaking pioneer, um, goes by the name of Charlie Walbridge. So as a bit of a, as a bit of a pioneer on rivers and creeks back in the day. And when I say back in the day, I mean you know kind of in the late '60s and through the '70s. This is the boat that I used when I tried out for the uh, Wildwater team in 1975. Not the fastest in the world, but it's in kind of rough shape. I've only been in it about two or three times in the last 25 years. And then there, that's the Munich Hahn, which this one built here the 1972 is Olympics. an old Czech boat. Used in, used in the, uh, but the, uh, the natural colored boat, that's a Phoenix slipper. The first successful slalom kayak that was designed the by white somebody boat there in is an country. interesting one because that was the first See, Most of these boats boat. were given to me. The only boat of theirs, mine, is that blue one. I probably built, you know, 20 or 30 I've boats. I've never taken I'm not account. Really you know, sure. Somebody will come up and say, do you want a such and such boat? And I'll say, sure. And they'll come up and drop it off. You know, I haven't been up here for probably a year or so. I grew up in New York City. And I was one of these kids who wasn't really sure that there was dirt underneath all of the, all of the concrete and asphalt. But I went away to, away to summer camp in, in New Hampshire, did a lot of hiking. Wasn't too sure I liked canoeing, because canoeing always seemed to involve being wet and sandy all the time. But then I went to college in central Pennsylvania, and my roommate was a fellow who had been a camp counselor but at a canoe camp. And we, tr we started an outing club there at, at Bucknell. And we were open canoe people. We were paddling conventional aluminum canoes, the kind that make a big boom when you hit a rock. And we went up to the, we were up at the Loyal Sock and saw these people in kayaks. I wasn't there, but my roommate was, and he came back all excited. We asked for a pool session at our university, and the coach, who was a swimming coach, sort of looked at us through narrowed, slitty eyes and said, and said, nobody is putting their dirty boats in our pool. Well, we were fortunate in that our faculty advisor Dr. Nicholson was on, an, on a committee called The Place of Sport and University Life. And he went over and talked to Coach Russell about how if he couldn't find a way to accommodate us, he'd have to bring it before the committee. And that undoubtedly they would, they would have a lot of questions for him. And so Coach Russell called me up and he said, you can, ha you can have from eight o'clock until 10 o'clock on Sunday figuring that no way we would do that. But of course we said yes. I had come, I had come out here for the Savage Races. I uh, ran the cheat with Bob Burrell and Paul Davidson, who as I said, you know, wrote the first guidebook. You know, I realized that this area is a really fine area for whitewater. There's just a lot of op different opportunities very close by, a lot of rainfall. You know, there's something going all the time got run off the upper yacht at a high flow and got a rapid named after me as a result.
Charlie's choice. My choice was to hike out at that point, because I was getting seriously outgunned. Not that many first descents. A lot of early descents. Well, one of them is the upper Blackwater. Another one is the Little Sandy in the early 70s, which was, which was when, you know, I was in my 20s. You didn't see people who were multi-sport athletes. You didn't see a guy who climbed and hiked and mountain biked and skied and boated. Because boating was pretty much a full-time job. You were making your gear, you were making, you were making your boat, you were trying to figure out where you should go. And there was a lot, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of offer of time that was needed. And now, you know, you take a kayak, you can just take it off the shelf, put it in the water and paddle. Of course, canoes were the traditional way of navigating around this area. The, the rivers were highways and the major cities like Pittsburgh were put at major, at major, at major river confluences. Kayaks were used, were, used in the far, were used in the far north and those were the kinds of designs that people were starting with. When I started paddling, the, uh, a race boat was a four meter boat which was 13 feet two inches long. Over time, the lengths of the boats has shortened. And of course, I knew things had changed. When this kid was up at the upper yacht and he had a Miata, he was sitting in the driver's seat and his uh, 007, which was a seven foot boat, was just chunked into the passenger seat. That really went mainstream because these boats were also reasonably comfortable. And, and so you just had, at the same time, really a tremendous influx of of young people. I grew up uh, about, I'd say it's like 10 miles north of Cumberland on Bottle Run actually, which is uh, back in uh, Prohibition days they used to make booze there and uh, um, my property is right where the creek comes right out of the ground. We used to go fishing all the time and canoeing you know that sort of thing, like just kind of float trips they would call it around here. But. Uh, I think I was probably like 12 or 13 and my parents bought me a kayak for Christmas actually. But I was really, really pissed because I wanted a um, trampoline for Christmas. We went kayaking probably when I was 12 or, when I was like 13 I'd say. My dad went with me and uh, he, pr he pretty much flipped over after about a minute of kayaking and then I went and did the rest of it like it was like a mile I just kept going by myself so when I moved back I got that I got that um, the, the I got the boat out of the garage and that we still had the life jackets and the paddle and everything so Nathan he was just starting to get into it and so he was all about he was like yo you got a kayak so I'm gonna buy this kayak you know when I decided to buy a whitewater kayak uh, actually went through a place in confluence uh, called River Sport once I you know once I got a job up there um, between the owner and some of the other kayak instructors that worked up there they just kind of uh, sort of I guess I could say they took me under their wing and just showed me the ropes of whitewater and uh, so it was actually through Nathan that I got introduced to the people that I vote with now it, uh, there's a lot of local people around and it's like you when you find a group then you sort of just make yourself work into that and that's how you learn you know I, I appreciate the young guys for what they are and what they're doing which is way beyond what we imagined and hopefully they appreciate they appreciate people like me the way I appreciated the guys who went before me there's a lot of people that are still around here and I'm sure have some pretty amazing stories about running stuff back in you know, the 1960s when you made your own kayaks um, and your garage out of fiberglass. To look at the boat and look at the paddle and just look at all the gear, um, it's really amazing to me because those people um, that were boating in that era, as you know, they were the, the true pioneers. You know, when we first came here, one of the things that became real obvious is that the locals were pretty scared of the water. But a lot of times when we would talk to a local, they would tell us about relatives or friends who had been killed trying to cross a river or swimming in a river. In terms of this sort of playful rec uh, recreation sport, like as a sport, you know, is sort of a fairly new thing, I think. That On the one hand, there is a tradition. The tradition goes back to the post-war era when people started coming out here. But they aren't locals. Um, eventually, 
you started to get local paddlers, usually from usually from around the university towns. But um, the people the people out here think it's pretty nuts. My neighbors across the road, who I think highly of and who are wonderful people, they would no more get in a raft and go down the river than fly to the moon. The way rivers are used is, to me, is sort of like the continuance of the tradition. You look at how all these places pop up on the map based on where rivers are and where the where water is. You just start to get into kayaking, and you start looking at all the, you bust, take out the map and you like pull it out, and you know, especially one of the maps that shows all the rivers, you know, and it, you can just look, well, look where this river comes into that river and then this river comes down. And kayaking is this way of understanding the landscape and how, the, how this, how all this place comes together through the movement of water. Well, when you learn how to paddle white water, all of a sudden you're very aware of how water moves. You find yourself looking at drainage ditches and, and small streams and even the ocean in a completely different way. You're in the flow and so it's, a, it's, gra it's, it's using gravity to move through the medium and then also opposing gravity at certain points and being able to move back and forth between all that and with balance and with, you know, strength. There are an awful lot of wrestlers who have become good paddlers. I think it's because unlike a ball sport like, like football or baseball, you're really reacting to the, the uh, pressure and force that your opponent is putting on you. And you'll sort of see this thing where people are kind of pushing at each other and then all of a sudden there's a flurry. And in the same way with paddling, you're say out on a wave or playing a hole or you're pushing against the water and the water is pushing against you and you're trying to use the water to move yourself. You have to take that point where it's like you, you're, you're able to look at the river and see what's happening, which is actually one of the most fun parts about kayaking because that's, your, that's understanding. You know, that's, that's one of the things about, uh, about boating. It, it's 90% it's mental. The, you know, the, the physical dynamics of the water are fascinating. And of course it's, you know, the other thing is that rivers are, in a, are amazingly beautiful, especially the rivers, the Appalachian rivers, where you have the moving water, which is so alive and reflects light in so many interesting ways. And then you have the hills behind it. It's uh, it's a remarkably rich scene. To be there and, it, and to have it be that free-flowing and moving is, is an amazing experience. And no matter what, it's just it's about being out there and enjoying yourself just when it comes down to it. It doesn't have to be a near, uh, it doesn't have to be a near-death experience. And at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day when it's all said and done, you know, I'm always glad, I'm always glad I've done it because I, it's just, uh, it's really about overcoming personal challenges and fears. It's just about the, the love of being on the water, man. I can't do what I used to do. I go, I, my, the water levels that I go out are, on are less challenging and I don't do certain moves just because I know I can't do them. But I can never lose interest because the river itself is so interesting. I don't think I could sum it up in a sentence. You know, I love being, I love being on moving water. I love the feel of it. Maybe I shouldn't drink it. How strong are these? I, can, oh, I guess I can move with this thing. It's confusion setting in. Should I mention my friend here? <laughs> I've actually never been kayaking. This guy, I don't know, who is this guy? <laughs> and that actually is something that old Pappy and John John and I have talked about before. Hey, old Pappy. Oh, Pappy John John, it's good to hear from you. <laughs>